Hello, and welcome to this panel entitled Reform Stimulate Foreign Investors. Now, Asia as a region attracts more foreign direct investment than any other part of the world in total. It hosts some of the most important FDI destinations and some of the largest and most important economies. So its fortunes have significant consequences globally. But of course, many of the countries in Asia were hit hard by COVID um, and are in varying places on the recovery path. So we'll talk about some of these recovery prospects, how the investment map is changing, and how COVID support schemes and reform programs impact these prospects. We'll also shine a light on a few important emerging investment destinations in the region. We have an excellent group um, scattered across multiple time zones right now and with, with um, different locations of, of base, but also different areas of expertise. So I think we're going to have an excellent, well-rounded discussion here that I'm really looking forward to facilitating. Let me introduce them to you now. We have Fred Burke, a senior advisor at law firm Baker & McKinsey in Vietnam. We have Victor Guer managing partner of Guer and Partners, which is a non-traditional investment banking firm focusing on tech investment. Um, with apologies if I mispronounce um, anyone's names, I am doing my best with them. We have Fariel Mustafi, chairwoman of the China-Iran Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. We have Saurabh Shukla, founder and editor-in-chief of News Mobile in India. We have Sin Ma, Managing Director for Total Energy Ventures, which is the venture capital arm of Total Energies. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I'll start with Fred, if that's okay. Um, maybe, Fred, I know that you, you're based in Vietnam and you have um, particular um, experience and expertise there. And we definitely want to hear about Vietnam because it's quite um, a fascinating and increasingly important investment destination. But first, if we just look at the big picture, um, and how do you see the investment landscape in Asia at the moment? And how is it maybe being impacted, not just by COVID and, and lockdowns, uh, but also by some trends that seem to have been accelerated by the pandemic, like reshoring and automation? Okay, um, very good. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm focused very much on my work on Vietnam, but, but, but um, in terms of the regional perspective, I do hear from our colleagues in the region, you know, things that amount to, to trends. And, and, and one of them is that, you know, since World War II, Asia has been just a, a train through um, on, on, uh, on, on success in terms of especially alleviation of poverty. Just the, the number of people lifted out of poverty when a growing population in a broad part of the world that's very important to stay stable and peaceful is, is been fantastic. It's been a testament to international trade. It's been a testament to the WTO system and everything else that was put into place after WTO, or sorry, after World War II. But now, um, I think that there there were already some political challenges, you know, protectionism emerging, populism, um, jobs shifting too quickly without proper retraining in the um, you know development markets like the U.S. Uh, and so we find ourselves in a place where you have these trade imbalances and 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 uh, and and work, and work issues. So. Um, on comes engineering, robotics, artificial intelligence, and all of a sudden, you know, things that didn't quite make sense two years ago um, after COVID in terms of reshoring, bringing back the manufacturing to the Pacific Northwest for your tennis shoes, things that didn't really make sense before, um, now with robotics and, and all this stuff, they do. Um, and so there is some of that going on. I can't say, you know, in terms of basic manufacturing, I can't say that this is an overwhelming trend, but I also would say that it's something that countries in the region really do have to watch out for. And it's not necessarily a good thing. I mean, you know, the fact that I always felt that the fact that China and the U.S. were engaged in trade and investment was good for world peace because we had an interest in each other's prosperity. And if they become more and more competitors with fewer and fewer direct links and dependencies on each other, it's not a good thing to not a good thing to disengage the whole the whole supply chain. So um, so hopefully, um, you know, people will look at this as a chance to put into place the right reforms to keep uh, investment and trade balanced and, and, and sort of you know, doing the right things at the right places, able to move around to the, the right opportunities around the world. Um, we're at a crossroads also in terms of energy. And so it'll be great to hear from Total about what good, good things they're doing. We're doing a lot here in Vietnam um, about um, solar energy. You know, out of, after five years, where five years ago it was nothing, um, now it's 20%, over 20% of the national installed capacity for energy is, is, is solar energy. It's fantastic. So um, 
there's a lot, a lot of good things you can, people can do in the situation, but you know, it's again, it's a crossroads. So don't, it's not guaranteed. It's, there's lots of countries with a bright future behind them. I always like to say. Great. And I think um, one of those countries is, is, um, is probably Vietnam, but I want to circle back on that, but you've kind of teed up Zin very well. Um, she is working a lot um, in the area of investments in clean energy, and I know is, is extremely engaged in the topic of climate change. So I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you now, what investment opportunities do you feel the energy transition is creating in Asia? Um, and, I, and I know that, you know, something that we've discussed um, between us is that Asia is, is obviously critical to address climate change globally. It, it just can't be done um, while Asia playing a leading role. So how can governments and private sector tackle it there properly? Thank you so much. Um, I absolutely think Asia is critical for the energy transition and the climate challenge with a population accounting for 60% of the world population and CO2 account for uh, almost 50%. Uh, and most importantly, uh, compared to the developed world, Asia is still growing. It's still very young. The economy is still, um, uh, we, we can see the energy intensive to some extent. As Fred said, they need to be uh, industrialized still. Um, so I think Asia plays an important role. What we have seen is uh, there are a lot of resources these days are pulling into the energy sector. But to some extent, I think it's proportionally not enough in Asia. Uh, because I think a lot of the investment agency, a huge funds has been set up every day, you know, billion dollar funds, KKR from Amazon, from uh, different even private equity institutions. A lot of them, if we see clearly, are allocated to resources and more mature. So uh, technology is more mature. So the real solution, the real problem in Asia has less share of resources in here. So that's really what we see. But at the same time, I think Asia has, has I really, really have a lot of advantages in taking advantage of this energy transition, climate challenge, and opportunities come out of it. The reason for that is, uh, as Fred said, because of some of the lack of the uh, development stage, they're actually capable of leaping frog to the next stage. And uh, well, for the Western countries, it's difficult actually for the heavy industry infrastructure sector to move around from ex existing infrastructure. Well, Asia can start jumping from the stage in between and go to the cleaner parts. We see this in fintech. We see this in e-commerce. And, and, and I think we will see this coming also in the energy sector. So for us, we look a lot as, uh, at uh, several sectors. Mm -hmm. One is uh, electric mobility. We think that's a large, large, large opportunity for Asia because uh, not only it's uh, cleaner, uh, but also it's actually in terms of the um, cost of ownership, it's cheaper. Um, so that can make a sense to really uh, move from the IC to the to the electric vehicles, especially I think in a, a major part of Asia is uh, about two wheelers and three wheelers. This is going to make impact. So that's one sector we are looking at. And the second sector, as Fred has mentioned, is uh, renewable energy. There's a lot of resources in Asia. Some parts is not yet on the grid and um, uh, battery cost is dropping very quickly. So clean, clean kind of solar and wind plus battery are a good opportunity for Asia as well. Um, and I think in Asia, we also have great engineer. I think in Vietnam, a lot of our companies actually have engineer and IT services outsourced in Vietnam um, and uh, India as well. So we also see the AI solutions to make the grid actually more, more efficient, to integrate more renewables on the grid, at the same time to better manage the demand side, demand response and everything. So all in all, we think that it's critical. Currently, the resources are not, um, I think resources are not fairly allocated to Asia for many reasons, but there's a lot, a lot of opportunities to be done. And those actually are great economic growth opportunity for Asian economies as well. Over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And a few different points there that we, I think we're, we will return to. Um, and it's, it's obvious that technology has, has a key role to play in, in climate and carbon neutrality solutions. Um, so let's turn to our, our tech man, Victor. Uh, Victor is uh, been sort of uh, flying around the world, has a vast amount of international experience and a pretty keen eye on emerging technology. So I'm interested to hear from you, Victor, what's on your radar at the moment, especially as relates to Asia and opportunities there. I'm very, I'm very concerned about uh, everything related to probably to the supply chain disruption. 
-hmm. but I'm very happy on uh, how, uh, despite the disgrace of uh, of COVID for humanity and so on, uh, it helped a lot on the on the smallest details, and it enlightened us on the on the digital bridge between uh, us. For example, simple things as, you know, that's something that go powerful in my attention is that previously you you had to chase people to use things like DocuSign, right? Mm -hmm. But now a everyone will sign you an NDA and then you can automate the flows of paperwork. That's very common probably between uh, lawyers. Those small details is because now everyone is in Microsoft Teams, everyone is in Slack on the user level, everyone use mostly all digital tools or either you risk to, to fall apart. If you told me about uh, emerging trends and so on, that, that to me is probably the, slightly the, the advancement of the year. Of course, we can talk about fintech, blockchain. We see a lot of things on the decentralized space. Decentralizing uh, organizations is something that is uh, coming hot for the next years using uh, beyond blockchain. The idea of removing the central authority of any business to me is probably as much important as the internet because we're gonna create things that we are even unable to understand to the point that what happened when do you guys remember what what was the first uh, symbian apps uh, on nokia right uh, symbian apps are now just downloadable for uh, 20 megabytes uh, files and and that's the magic of a uh, of uh, exponential so also all those trends are really really exponential the the shorting the shorting of the, and the shortening of the times from gathering uh, let's say 1 billion users on the internet within 10 years for for 4 years for whatsapp and now uh, probably 1 2 years for uh, things like crypto then that's that's also something i i clearly really see and there's someone that pointed here about Asia. That's right. Asia is in the middle point of of exponential growth. I I've been saying for the last uh, two years that the the global center of the universe has been moved from the old Europe, which is very busy on the social all policies of welfare and and well being, to Asia and and North America and South America. It, you probably have the same case with South America and Asia, where the, there is an expectation for the population to reach a certain level of welfare uh, at, at all together with progress. But this progress doesn't have to go in, in between uh, uh, a station where you have to leverage people, right? So it, it is just a all straight line. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And you were mentioning about, you know, obviously the take up in internet usage, um, and online habits has big implications and it's a lot of things easier, creates efficiencies, makes the world of work easier. I guess uh, one of the darker sides of that is the explosion of disinformation um, found online. And this is the topic at heart of your work, Saurabh. So, um, and now obviously disinformation is a, a little bit of a, a cancer increasingly on politics and, and society. But what impact does it have on the business world and where are investors in all of this? Uh, thank you, Otney. Uh, and, and you aptly summed, summed it. I think it's a cancer. I, I would say that uh, cancer still has its cure. Uh, disinformation, uh, we are still in the process of getting a vaccine. And this is what we do at Newsmobile. I can tell you that one of the things the companies are not looking at, the investors are not looking at, is this entire spread of misinformation and disinformation because this can really impact a big billion dollars investment because there are so many times and during uh, the work that we have done we have realized that a certain project has run into trouble not necessarily because of the local political issue not because of the fact uh, that the, the investor never uh, took into account the local condition but also enormous uh, disinformation that went about, uh, say, by rival or by sometimes third countries. So that's something which is very uh, much of a concern. I think uh, today, if you ask me, one of the biggest challenges that any democracy faces is because of misinformation and disinformation and investment is directly tied to it. The welfare of the people cannot happen till the time you get 
uh, investment coming in because that uh, creates growth opportunities and it's all directly tied in and that's the reason why uh, we need to focus it uh, on a really a global scale especially countries you know we work out of uh, india and asia pacific and singapore and we are seeing the enormous amount of uh, misinformation and you know we as a fact checker uh, we are working on some unique things in fact one of the things we are working on is climate mis- misinformation because we are realizing that even projects even renewable energy that has been impacted by this so that's the reason why companies also uh, need to look at it because you know this is something when you are looking at an investment decision you cannot overlook the fact that this may actually mar your potential investment so you have to check how you can detect this early on so you can take corrective measures and that's the reason why i would say that the governments uh, uh the corporates uh you know people at large have to make sure that they know we uh, to just give you an example we we trained public officials and uh, across asia pacific recently uh with along with the tech major and we realized that post the trainings uh, they came back to us and said hey we didn't they didn't know that a uh, simple tools could help us detect misinformation so imagine uh, we we train companies now uh, senior executives now because they need to know when they are making information decision they, when they get reports coming in that this is this particular report has happened in that particular area because of a uh, sustained uh, disinformation by a rival or misinformation in fact we are working on a very unique ai tool but obviously i think time is short but uh, this is a problem which i think impacts everyone yeah it it certainly does and i think it's not often discussed about the impact actually on the business world but clearly if if consumers clients customers and rivals are consuming or even weaponizing disinformation the risk are quite huge so i think we're going to come on to the topic of of risk with you um yeah. in a moment but we'll move on to ferial uh now so you know when we're thinking about investment destinations um quite interesting for us to hear a little bit about iran obviously um on the sort of the the fringes of of western asia the country a bit um i guess hamstrung a bit by its ability to participate in the fdi value chain because of sanctions uh, feral how do you see things now how are the uh, potential negotiations around this going to impact the the potential and maybe also what what kind of trade and investment links you could see flowering between Iran and and for example eastern um uh, east asian locations like china hong kong and so on well first of all thank you very much for my invitation to this panel uh as i explained before i mean i was supposed to be on a panel of uh, road and belt initiative which iran is a strategic good location on that uh, project but here i have to give you just some uh, information about iran which maybe the audience would like to hear you know as you know for the past decade due to sanction iran has largely uh, missed out on the globalization wave but we are hoping once the sanction is over and once this international limitation are over uh, iran has an opportunity to engage more deeply with the global economy and receive the benefit of globalization there is a considerable expectation within iran matched by the interest in the international business community of moving the economy onto a new growth path uh with the potential which iran has in different field as you know well we have a vast reserve of oil gas and i mean lots of mineral and uh, i just uh, want to tell you that before the revolution happened in iran if we go back to about 43 years ago iran was really a good hub for the attraction of foreign investment most of the countries over here and they want and they did a lot of investment in iran but after the um, uh, revolution happened in iran and some problem between iran and the america uh, we have not been able really to attract foreign investment 
uh, with the potential which Iran has. Uh, and definitely with the, uh, well, we have, a, um, I don't know, I would like to give you Iran, we have an area of more than 1.6 million uh, kilometer in a very strategic position between Caspian Sea in the north and the Persian Gulf on the south. Okay, so Iran geography position at the junction of east and west will uh, give it a unique role to act as a key regional player in economic relation. You know, Iran also provides the possibility of serving as a link to the nearby developed energy resources of the Caspian Sea, as well as an exploitation of the resources and commodity through the well-equipped port of south of Iran. Um, as um, well, you know, Iran is located on the route of air corridor, communication road, railway grids, and all conveyance lines. Uh, and has the immediate access to the neighboring country with a population of more than 600 million people. So, anybody comes to Iran and make investment in Iran, definitely we benefit a lot because Iran is a rich country with a rich resources. Um, so, uh, anyway, we are hoping in a changing world and a fast growing country like Iran with the abundant resources, we look forward to opportunity of cooperation between Iran and the world. You know, uh, after the revolution, China has been substituted to USA, Germany, Japan, and all that. So our first um, trade partner at present is China. Uh, but anyway, we as a private sector, we are definitely hoping that all this uh, international limitation will be over and once again Iran can come back to the uh, world uh, market. Yes, Thank indeed. You. There will certainly be some, some pretty big opportunities um, if, that, if that happens and if negotiations conclude in a successful way. And um, Thank you for, for sharing the, the information and your, your outlook. Um, we stay on the topic of um, investment destinations, one that is um, still at the emerging stage, but, but but quite well established on the FDI radar is Vietnam. So it's been an FDI hotspot in recent years and was kind of benefiting from a trend of shifting some, some production um, out of China to other places in the region. So Fred will... You know what are what are Vietnam's prospects as an FDI destination going forward, and what's the government doing there in the way of reforms, incentives, and so on to help stimulate investment? Yeah, we could take. Um, I don't want to take up all of the rest of our time because there's so many, obviously, so many interesting threads here to follow, um, and they are related to uh, misinformation. Is, is is something that you know follows us around the world with um, MNCs, and you know, even when they try to do good things. But the point is, I think, with Vietnam. Um, you know, considering what I said before, they are at a crossroads like many people. If they do the right thing now, then, you know, and they continue to do the right things they've been doing and they hold to it, then, then their chances of success are very good. Um, you know, they've, they've been able to attract huge amounts of foreign investment, even better than, than India, for example, with its bigger population and its democracy and its education levels and everything that India has going for it. Nevertheless, Vietnam, for one, the reasons you said, there was, there was the, the, the somewhat of a shift from China, partly originally driven by cost, later driven by trade wars. Um, but that, that's not the whole story. It was just Vietnam itself looking at um, other countries, including China, and see how did they get up on their feet? How did they do so well? And then grabbing onto those reforms uh, in, in, a, in a very strong way. And those reforms evolved day by day. One of the great reasons for their success has been their openness and willing to engage with the business communities from various countries in the world. They're very balanced and multilateralist. And we all go in and talk about our issues and they work out solutions. We have this administrative procedure reform council that, that advises the prime minister on, on new, um, new regulations and to see whether there's an easier way to do it from 
um, uh, uh, administrative procedure um, perspective. So the OECD has given us some some funding for that. It's been very effective, um, the, the impact of those kinds of uh, measures. And now it's really part of the psyche of the Vietnamese uh, officials and lawmakers that they want to make things more more efficient. And in the, in the, in the issue of um, COVID and um, executive mobility, um, movement of natural persons, it's been a huge issue about whether they control people coming in, how they can quarantine, what pro- approvals you need. Um, and a big element of that conversation is there's public health safety, public health and safety. There's also this administrative procedure reform just to make business here um, easier because if it's too hard to get here, people can't invest here. That's a, that's a real problem right now. Um, they also, you know, Vietnam is kind of in a unique situation. It just emerged as a kind of middle income country with $100 billion in, in reserves right before COVID hit. And that's, you know, that's after 30 years of slogging away in the trenches day by day, exporting Nikes and furniture and sea products and some, some natural resources. Um, you know, they just built it up over steadily over those years. And then wham, we got this COVID and the export markets, the supply chain are really disrupted. Um, I was back in the States last month and I was hearing nothing but, oh, you know, the supply chain's disrupted because the longshoremen are on strike and the unions are causing trouble. They won't work hard enough to get all the things off the ships and ships are backed up. And, but, and none of that discussion looked beyond the border of the United States. It, it didn't talk, talk about Vietnamese workers not going back into their Nike factories because they're afraid of getting infected. And the, and the solution for that being give them some vaccinations. Um, we need to, to really push the vaccines out more in poor countries like Vietnam that initially had a little bit of fun funding problems, where we were going to get the money. They've solved that. Now something like 65% of the Vietnamese population has had at least their first shot and over 60% um, even two shots. So they're, they're really making progress. And once they, they grab onto something and decide to do it, then the progress is great. So um, I'd say um, that on the other good things, you know, that there's some classic you know, investment advantages that Vietnam has had and, and, and other countries can take advantage of too. They they do have, you know, one thing is a, their demographics. It's a very young population, but it's a young population that's getting old quickly. So they've got another 10, 15 years of, you know, people in their prime working and spending um, um, days of their life. Uh, so they realize that they've got to, you know, move fast with this program and it's not helping them. That's, 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 that's bringing them back. So how to balance that? Treaties, free trade agreements. Vietnam has been from the day I got here in 1991, they could talk about nothing else but, you know, getting into the WTO, getting bilateral trade agreements with their main trading partners, opening up the TPP, um, the, now it's the CPTPP, all these other um, free trade agreements, RCEP. Um, they have a very good trade agreement with China that's helped them become part of the China supply chain. Uh, it's it, it, That's been a deliberate strategy um, of the government to, to you know, integrate with, with the global economy and create jobs by, you know, getting into foreign markets. And they've just done a fantastic job on that. And they've been very open and receptive to, you know, foreign you know, input for all that to happen. Um, I just go, going back to the, you know, the, the, the point that was made before about leapfrogging. They did leapfrog an, analog telephone technology f- using digital technology back in the in the 90s and today with energy um, it's not we do have an incumbent for it for oil uh, for fossil fuel energy that's petro vietnam and there's a vina Komen is a very big employer for the coal industry so we do have some interest to overcome uh, in terms of coal and how to accommodate those write-offs of those big expenses and in terms of fulfilling cop uh, uh, obligations but the, the 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 sentiment is that you know they've got an agricultural economy too to protect by not using coal. And if the coal increases the way it's supposed to, then they're you know the the human human uh, health consequences the consequences to the environment are serious. So lots lots of good thought and, and good good reactions to that. People moving, um, and the, and again you know just the fact that they have this open dialogue with everybody, all the stakeholders. Um, it, it really it really is is, a, is obviously a good way for a country to develop. Thank you. Yeah, and some of these dilemmas that you mentioned, they're sort of trade-offs of, of development, but meeting meeting um, COP26 obligations while at the same time trying to, you know, uh, bring in investment, create jobs, uh, bring, the, bring the economy into recovery. They're not really very easy dilemmas for governments to solve. And Sin, I know that this is a topic that is kind of at, at heart of your work. And how do you see the balance being struck between economic development and the pressures um, of trying to spur recovery and attract investment on the one hand and, and carbon neutrality metrics on the other? And is this balance harder to strike after COVID and all the challenges it brought? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, I think it, it is naturally challenging 
simply because the state of the economic growth, uh, I think, as a, in the uh, COP26, uh, the Indian delegates has a very, <laughs> I think they, they, they said uh, we need to balance a, the economic development and the climate impact. I think uh, that's re representing a lot of mentalities of the uh, regulators and authorities in the region. Um, so I totally agree. I think, you know, we, to some extent, they should have a large scale energy uh, resources. They cannot just have distributed solar to, to power a heavily industrialized country. They have the right to do so. Um, and um, mm -hmm. at the same time, I think it's, it's what is really, really important is government to have this mentality that, uh, first of all, uh, I think a lot of the countries in, in, in Asia, especially the developing Asia, they will have a higher share of negative impact out of climate because a lot of them are at sea level, a lot of them be, uh, are more dependent on agriculture, a lot of them don't have the facilities and infrastructure protect, protect them. So first one, I think it's just uh, in terms of time, it's very urgent to preparing for that, knowing that all these projects need uh, decades of time. And secondly, it's really there will be opportunity and there, there are a lot of opportunity for developing Asian countries to benefit um, out of the, all the solutions needed for addressing the energy transition and climate change. I think re also hardware, to some extent, could be um, uh, global um, if, the current, if the current situation will continue, if there is no decoupling. So the batteries, the solar panels, those can be global. But the, the fi final piece of it, the, the real value-added solutions, are uh, very often what we actually see is uh, out of the ground. So in our, in, I have colleagues investing in U.S., I have colleagues investing in Europe. They already have wonderful uh, startups with uh, uh, engineers graduated from, from MIT, from Imperial College. But those solutions, very often, we cannot just uh, put them in Asian countries and apply on them. Uh, some of them is not apl applicable and some of them is just too, too expensive. So we see that the innovation is actually coming locally and the government and economy can benefit a lot out of it. We see this on the battery swap for electric vehicles. We see this on the uh, hybrid energy solutions. Um, we've, we've also um, see this, for example, plastic recycling. We see great entrepreneurs. We see it on smart grid. All these solutions we see actually coming from the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, local solutions. So I think it's critical for the government to realize there is something urgent in need to be done for the for the benefits and well-being of the population. And secondly, its own, um, I, th I think, entrepreneurs and economy can really benefit out of the good framework from the government uh, to encourage them to really benefit from innovation. I think uh, Victor has mentioned all this technology, deep tech, those we can found in Asia. So I think uh, I'm very hopeful and I see every day positive things happening. Um, absolutely. And, and all the major Asian countries already have the, you know, green, I think, green aware um, uh, stimulus plan. Or they all have plans to encouraging renewable energy and electric mobility. So I'm really, really hopeful to look what is happening going forward. Great. And as you mentioned about innovation, I'd like to bring in Victor here. Um, what what is the appropriate role for governments to play in encouraging entrepreneurialism and innovation um, and that's how we get the amazing ideas and technology where is the balance struck between being too heavy-handed and too much regulation um, too much forcing um, innovation um, as opposed to encouraging it well i think i think first of all one of the things that was mentioned now that uh, made me a point is that in reality, in Asia, we don't need to, there's another advantage that we have not considered is that we don't need to, to make their population digital. They are digital natives, all of them, because they have everything in their mobile. Not, they don't even probably, some of them, it, it, you may, it, they don't even use, uh, Frederick might, might tell you more about that probably, but they don't even use the computer as much and they will be happy to walk in uh, with an iPad or or just with the phone and, and take care of, of their emails. And and I, I see that gap also in the States between the investment banking analysts that you see to go into the office with an iPad rather than with a computer and then they do the thing and whatever and it's exactly the same user experience. But it's something that they have integrated so deeply that no one beyond 40 or 50 understands. That's uh, in terms of leveling the, the playground. In terms of, uh, of regulation, 
there's a major problem uh, as per the European experience, which is let's regulate everything, and then uh, it's so regulated and so heavy handled that you end uh, needing the, so many licenses and authorizations for moving a finger, then you lose the window of opportunity. And then uh, people, they want to spend a lot of money on uh, uh, on programs and resources and may, let's make it entrepreneurial for the sake of making it entrepreneurial. But in reality, it doesn't matter if you don't, if you, if you kill it early, right? It's something I see on digital, on digital assets is that, for example, the U.S. is not heavily regulating the industry until to 2023, 2024. And then in Europe, banks do not even allow you to, to interact with digital assets call it crypto, call it whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, in Asia, it's totally the, the opposite. You have the heavy-handed China about the topic, but everyone else is quite soft about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, I, I think it's um, the the need for the regulation to maybe, or the regulatory environment, rather, to not just catch up with the technologies, but almost be in front of them, which is quite difficult. Um, but it's because the the stakeholders do not do not interact yet with uh with let's say with uh, technology companies i saw that also between for example uh global diplomats that are in uh, frontier markets that they want to understand what was going what is going to happen but they are always one step behind and they never take the lead about putting the rules early or helping industries to create their own rules because they still think about uh about it as a as a legacy let's say, leg legacy bureaucrats, right? Mm -hmm. So no one teach them about uh, how, how to handle that. I mean, we can't even tell them that, that it's their fault, but this is how it's set up. Yeah, it's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, Surab, I want to bring you in here. Yeah. It looks like you have a comment, but I also want you to maybe address the issue that you alluded to in your initial discussion about risk and how investors can be aware of and sort of attuned to local political risk factors? Well, just to add to what uh, Zin and Victor were referring to, uh, one of the things obviously we need is, and I know, uh, you know, I run a company which has thrived on innovation all by itself, uh, is deregulation. Sometimes, and I can give you India's case where uh, today uh, there is a big call for deregulation, especially when it comes to the digital media and uh, digital companies because you know there is a still tussle because the government still is trying to evolve a mechanism and here we are saying that we need to have a self-regulatory mechanism uh, shifting gears to what you uh, are asking me risk assessment is a huge thing which the companies cannot uh, do without investors cannot do without i can give you an example of a a country like India, where uh, billions of dollars have been invested by companies, and in, again, FDI inflows have been at a record high, uh, even uh, you know in a COVID scenario. But a lot of companies, and you know, we 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 also advise a lot of companies uh, sometimes don't realize that there is a risk, inherent risk, and I mentioned about the risk of misinformation, the risk of disinformation, and also low factors, uh, uh, especially in Asia. I would say. Uh, than in any other region, uh, you know, local factors play a key role. You know, what is the kind of political uh, landscape that you're looking at? And not only the existing landscape, uh, beyond that as well. What is, uh, you know, are there any uh, problems which are inherent? Because sometimes what happens is you become a collateral damage. You know, the, the you know, and sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it, maybe it's your rivals, maybe uh, it's a different political group which thinks that oh, a government has allowed X company to come in to invest, uh, this will help them get more votes in the next elections because people will, uh, there will be economic growth there. So let's let's hit it. You know, sometimes uh, there will be misinformation, disinformation coming out. So, you know, there are multiple factors, as I say, that X factor should not be forgotten by investors, by large companies, even investment fund. Because I do believe that while they are making sure that they are spending too much time energy in making sure oh whether it's a robust uh, investment or not they do their due diligence but they're not they're missing out some of these key factors which will be pivotal as you go especially in a digital age india is a country which huge proliferation of in fact the india lives on its mobile in fact 
you know, uh, you know, Victor mentioned about mobile. India is a classic case where you may not have somebody, uh, you know, using internet on, you know, on a laptop or on a computer, but mobile, everybody has it. So uh, when you have mobile, while it empowers you, it also becomes a channel sometimes by used by, uh, you know, bad actors who use it to spread misinformation, disinformation. And that is something investors have to account for. And I would say that uh, this is a challenge uh, we have to overcome together. In fact, I say, yeah, in fact, this is something, a punchline that we say that, you know, we are bringing out a news mobile, a vaccine for fake news and misinformation. And I think it's very much needed uh, in the years to come, uh, especially given the fact that it impacts uh, people directly. Yeah, that, well, the implications of, of disinformation are, are enormous and they cut across pretty much Sectors, all, yeah. all aspects. Um, Faria, I'm keen to hear from you as we, as we um, move towards wrapping up. How do you think some of these trends and dynamics that your colleagues here have been speaking about from use of technology, um, energy transition, um, how do these things manifest themselves in Iran and are there opportunities um, there in a country like Iran to maybe exploit some of these wider macro trends? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, uh, due to sanction problem, we have been missed out. And um, so not much of uh, foreign investment has happened in Iran since 40 years ago till now. With the, of course, there has been some investment but not enough to the potential which Iran has. Uh, as uh, we know all, you know, energy is a very important source which Iran has. You know, after, I just want to mention something. After the JCPO was signed in the year of 2016, uh, within a few months, we had about 300 big delegation from all over the world to Iran, headed by the president, by the ministers, by the uh, prime ministers and all that. So that shows what the potential Iran has, okay? Uh, for example, I just would like to mention something. In our energy source, uh, we need about 160 billion of dollars to be invested in our oil uh, sector. Is huge, you know, uh, and uh, well, Iran is a country uh, is the is the 18th largest country in the world with the uh, good purchasing power parity basis. You know, the country has really got the ancient tran tradition of entrepreneurship. Uh, well, we have almost 80 million population, which I mentioned before, about 600 people neighboring. And uh, we have a very young uh, population, you know, uh, which is highly educated. And uh, we have a wealth of really natural resources. So what Iran is missing now at present is only this problem of international limitation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure once this is over, Iran can go back and be the hub of the Asia Middle East again, once again. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, we are hoping. You know, what problem at present we are facing is, uh, I mean, uh, lots of, even uh, as I mentioned, well, China is our first uh, trade partner, but due to the sanction problems, they cannot come and make investment because you know the banking system is not working with Iran. Yeah. Uh, and even the people whom they like to come and make investment, okay, they cannot bring their money in or out. Though you know Iran has got a very good, I mean, uh, offering a very good uh, supporting for the foreign investment. For example, uh, no limitation on the uh, share of the company. I mean, the foreigner can uh, hold 100% share of the company. You know, we have a very low uh, rate of taxation, which is only 25%, mm -hmm. and, um, and so on. 
<laughs> we will have to. Very, very sorry. I think we're, we're, we've come to our time, but it, it's it's clear that there are these massive opportunities that that can potentially be unlocked there if the if the um, political um, situation is resolved. So there'll be a lot of attention on that, I think, in the in the next months and 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 into next year as to resolution there. Thank you very much, um, all of you. I wish we could talk longer because there's a lot of interesting things that we've touched on that probably warrant a panel in of themselves. But thank you to all of you for sharing your your insights, for joining us from your very um, uh, uh, very different places in the world and adding your, your views. Um, and I hope we have a chance to discuss some of these topics further in a, in a future panel. And thank you all for uh, tuning in and for watching and for your attention. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah. Thank you. It was nice to meet all of you. Thank, thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.